all right i am back again <laughs> so uh, next up we have the uh, we have a talk from aleandro um, who's going to be talking us uh, talking to us about production machine learning monitoring um, essentially how do we deal with outliers drift and um, and the overall statistical performance of the model um, great to have you here um, aleandro a bit about um, aleandro he is the chief scientist at the institute of um, ethical ai and machine learning um he is also the director of machine learning at selden technologies um we're really psyched to have you here um aleandro um the stage is all yours awesome yeah thank you very much um so uh yeah today uh we're going to be delving into a really interesting topic um the area of production machine learning in the context of monitoring uh production machine learning systems uh there's quite a lot of content to cover we're gonna pretty much um, dive into very high level uh, uh, areas. But uh, in this link that will be available throughout the presentation, you can access um, the blog post, which actually contains uh, the code examples and the open source uh, frameworks and the references that you will be able to test everything yourself uh, in, in, in your own spare time. So. Uh, a bit about myself, uh, my name is Alejandro. Uh, I'm the engineering director at Solid Technologies and chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI. Uh, I'm also a governing council member at large at the ACM. Um, Selden itself, uh, we are a machine learning uh, deployment management, monitoring and explainability open core framework. So we have a broad range of different open source technologies as well as our enterprise product uh, that builds on top of that. Uh, and the Institute is a uh, volunteer-led organization, uh, research center based in the UK that focuses on developing um, resources that ensure the responsible development and operation of AI systems. So now let's dive specifically into this topic. And um, what we're gonna be covering today is the motivations for this, some principles that you can adopt, some, some patterns that abstract some best practices and some handsome examples. Uh, one thing to mention is uh, that um, we are going to be exploring this from the perspective, not just of how can we deploy and monitor a model, but how can we actually enable this monitoring and more specifically advanced monitoring at scale with hundreds, if not thousands of machine learning models. So with that, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, um, you can find uh, you know the blog post with all of the resources. So please do check it out. And if you have any feedback, you know, you, the projects are open source, so you're able to actually provide any sort of uh, insights into that. Now, let's set the scene. Um, we all are aware that production machine learning systems are hard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of specialized hardware that is involved. There's a lot of complex dependency graphs. Uh, there's compliance requirements that go uh, not just to the same level that uh, software uh, environments require, but now with the nuances of machine learning, as well as the reproducibility uh, nuances that, that you need to have in place. So from that perspective, it is important uh, to take into consideration not just how you can develop and deploy those machine learning models um, to be able to have them in production, but how can you have more of a, 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 a proactive as opposed to reactive interaction on the performance of the model and being able to address some of the issues that may arise, such as performance drift, uh, as well as uh, uh, changes in the distribution of the data uh, of your production models. So the key context to remember throughout this is that um, now it's it's more popular belief um, that the life cycle of the model actually begins uh, once it's deployed, right? It doesn't end when you finish training it, is when you put it in production and it starts being consumed that the life cycle really uh, begins uh, and you need to make sure that you have the infrastructure and capabilities in place in order for you to um, uh, have uh, the robust uh, requirements uh, from a more proactive perspective. The uh, ability to know when you need to retrain the model, the ability to know when you have to uh, identify and deep dive into a specific prediction, as well as the general uh, health of the models themselves. So what we're gonna be doing today is see seeing how this applies into a model specifically. We're going to be deploying a single model as a microservice. We're going to be then able to see how this deployed model can't expose met metrics uh, that could be used for performance, 
for statistical performance, for outlier detection, for drift detection, and for explainability. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking the hello world of machine learning, this CIFAR 10 classification. This is basically a model that takes as an input an image and predicts one of 10 classes. In this case, it would be the image of a truck, and it would predict uh, you know, the last class, which in this case would be a truck. Right. So this is basically what our model is going to do. Given that we focus on the production uh, life cycle of the model, we're not going to be training the model from scratch, but the, but the code is available if you want to do it. It takes a couple of hours, uh, but we're going to be just fetching this ResNet32 uh, CIFAR 10 model. So it's basically a TensorFlow based model that we're going to be able to leverage with Python. We're going to be uh, running uh, the input being an image, and then the output in this case is going to be an array showing us that it's the image, uh, the class of a truck, right? The way that we're going to now productionize it is using this framework called Seldon Core. So Seldon Core allows you to convert uh, or go from a from an artifact, right? So what we just saw, a, a, a model artifact, an exported binary, like a pickled binary, or a Python, Java, or R code wrapper into a fully fledged microservice that can be deployed in Kubernetes and has a set of building blocks that allow you to actually connect into complex structures, like having multi-arm bandits, outlier detectors, feature transformations as part of your separate reusable components that in themselves are services, right? So the way that this is done is basically taking that artifact that we had or creating a class wrapper, which in this case is just a simple Python class with a predict method. Once we actually um, convert it into a full container using the source to image uh, command line interface, we're going to basically have a component, a container that we can deploy and that will expose a REST, gRPC, and Kafka endpoint that will allow us to be able to you know, perform inference on any, anything that we send. So whatever goes through this predict method basically is passed through the model and then is re returned to us, right? Very intuitive. Now, the way that we're able to leverage Seldon Core is through the Kubernetes way, right? Defining your configuration schemas or your manifests. In this case, we are able to leverage some of the prepackaged model servers. So in this case, it could be TensorFlow Serving, it could be Triton, it could be a scikit-learn model server. But in this case, we're using the TensorFlow server and we're providing that binary as a Google bucket, right? So what we ended up doing was just exporting the uh, artifact and then uploading it into a Google bucket so that we can then just provide this in this declarative way into Selden. So then Selden is able to uh, basically take this and create the relevant containers, services, networking, et cetera. So now this basically becomes a fully fledged microservice. Now we are able to see this as the same input that we were running in our local model. We can now run it as a REST request, right? So we're sending a request to a predict method containing that input image. And then our output is basically that class, which is basically a truck, right? So we've deployed the model, but again, this is where the talk really starts, right? Because the point of the talk is deploying the model and then monitoring it, right? So what we're going to now start looking at is um, the monitoring pieces, which you will be able to find a lot of relevant examples if, if you're interested to dive deeper into the Seldon Core repo. I mean, this is open source, so please go ahead. If you find an issue, you know, open an issue. That's the beauty of open source. So let's actually have a look at what, at what is the anatomy of production machine learning systems, right? Because the life cycle of a model starts from data to experimentation, to deployment, to monitoring, right? So the way that we can abstract it is by able to see that uh, a data scientist will be either through their Jupyter notebook or through an ETL uh, pipeline, they will be converting training data into train model artifacts, right? This could be either that binary that we saw before or uh, uh, the container that we saw before. Then the next step is to be able to productionize it either uh, you know, through the manual CLI or by introducing a CI pipeline that automatically performs that deployment that allows us to have those deployed services, which ultimately have inference data that passes through them, right? So any new data that you want to consume, you would pass it through the models. But where are the metrics, right? So the four key areas that we're going to be delving into today, uh, there are a little bit more, but um, these are performance metrics and, and tracing. So this is the same things that you would want to monitor for a microservice. Um, statistical performance. So this is basically model machine learning specific um, 
uh, metrics that you would want to monitor, drift detection and outlier detection uh, for uh, data that perhaps is uh, wanted to be flagged, uh, uh, being you know outside of the distribution in one way or another, and then finally explainability in the context of production models. Now, another reminder of the key thing that we said as a as a premise is that we are thinking about this not just from the perspective of how can we have monitoring for a model for a single model, but we want to ask the questions of what are the patterns that will al allow us to perform monitoring at scale, to have hundreds of models with perhaps dozens of advanced monitoring components. Because you have to remember that if you deploy a model and then you add a drift detector, even though the drift detector is in a way reducing risk for you to be able to say, well, now I have that component to be able to flag any issues, in a way you're introducing another machine learning component that equally requires monitoring in itself, right? So the, the drift component will also be a service that may fail may um, also suffer from the same challenges that other machine learning components would suffer from. So it's something to take into consideration that we will be addressing as we talk about the different patterns in a more sort of like higher level uh, perspective. So starting with performance monitoring, this is basically analogous to your machine learning microservice monitoring. So this is monitoring the performance of your running service, right? Uh, this is to identify potential bottlenecks in performance, debug and diagnose unexpected um, performance on that service. And this is really the usual things that you would imagine, like CPU percentage, et cetera, which we will see in a bit. The way that you would see it from a sort of more abstract perspective is that once you deploy your model, uh, one of the benefits of having these orchestration tools like Seldon Core is that not only it provides you with the endpoints to consume, but out of the box, it exposes those metrics that can be consumed by something like Prometheus. So you know if your model is suddenly uh, perhaps having a memory leak, you may, you may actually start to see that the uh, memory starts to increase up to a point where it may crash, and then you can actually go and check why did that happen. Similarly, you can actually see some things such as the performance of the model itself, given that a lot of the work that it's done is CPU intensive, right? So if you have worked with Python before, you know of the, um, you know of the of the of the uh, infamous uh, GIL, right? So from that perspective, it is how you are able to optimize for the internal configurations of your model server, such as minimizing in this case the number of threads, making sure that the number of workers are aligned to the number of cores, or well times two plus one, uh, and also making sure that you know, if you have too much, then it may actually end up with CPU throttling. So. There's quite a lot of things to consider, but uh, this, per this, this monitoring of performance is the same or analogous to the one that you would expect to have in microservices. And from that perspective, it could be things like latency, uh, requests per second, CPU memory uh, usage utilization, number of, 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 of successful and failed requests, et cetera, et cetera. So these are equally important and uh, still shouldn't be kind of like left off in your machine learning stack. The second point is statistical monitoring. So for statistical monitoring, we need to take into consideration now not just generic microservice metrics, because even though uh, it is still a production uh, software system, we are still dealing with something that is much more nuanced. And in this case, the machine learning components will also require some uh, further metrics that are going to be very specialized. In this case, it would be um, perhaps uh, something that may require uh, the correct target labels, right? So in your training environment, when you train your model, you're going to have your data and your target labels, right? And you're going to be able to train a model because you have all of that data in there. However, when you deploy a model, you are not going to have those target labels, right? Because it's inference data. It's unseen data points. And what that means is that in order for you to be able to calculate things like accuracy, precision, recall, uh, or other more uh, specific ones like RMSC or... Uh, uh, um, several others, you may require having what we refer to as stateful uh, metrics, right? Being able to collect those re uh, 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 annotations that include the correct target label that may be provided in, a, in an asynchronous way, right? So once you deploy a model, you receive some requests, you may need somebody to actually go and re-annotate those requests, then you will be able to start seeing some of those uh, 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 metrics like accuracy, precision, recall. 
Of course, there are others like KL divergence, as, as well as perhaps some that you don't require that feedback or that correct label. But from that perspective, it does open some challenges of how do we achieve or how do we enable for this concept of feedback at scale? So the way that we have been able to address this uh, with Seldon Core is that similar to how you have a predict endpoint that performs inference on top of your model, we actually also enable a feedback endpoint. And this feedback endpoint is able to use the unique re request ID that you receive when you actually send an inference to allow other individuals to provide those um, uh, correct labels, right? So you can do an inference request, you get told, okay, so this is request ID 55. Now somebody else later on can say, well, actually, I'm gonna now submit a uh, correct label for ID 55, right? So we can now see that from an architectural perspective, we now are able to abstract the concept of feedback as part of the models, where the inference request, as it, as it comes, it gets saved into a, in this case, key value store. And when the actual feedback is provided, um, instead of actually being calculated inside of the actual microservice, this uh, uh, corrected label is actually forwarded into any other advanced monitoring components that want to do something with it. In this case, we have a component that just so happens to be listening to, to any feedback to be able to take that ID, fetch the, 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 the inference request, make the comparison and update its current uh, status so that you're able to then expose the specific uh, stateful metrics through this advanced monitoring component, which we name as metric server. Now, some of the metrics that are provided wouldn't be just like the accuracy, right? Because you may want to actually have further granularity so that you can actually get, you know, things like the accuracy per class or per subclass. You may want to, to get the, the, the precision and recall per subclass, etc. So from that perspective, you may want to capture the true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives, and individual, um, you know, prediction probabilities, uh, as well as other things. Now, what, what a metric server looks like in, in practice, basically, it's another sort of like abstraction that allows you to basically take the, the, the truth, the response, and be able to calculate those particular components. So from that uh, uh, note, then you can see uh, the intuition of abstracting the, 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 the different servers and services so that you don't actually have to augment too much into the logic of your model itself, and also to not uh, affect the performance. Now, in regards to Outlier and Drift, uh, it's similar in regards to the principles and the core concepts. Outlier detection is to be able to identify uh, you know, potential anomalies in your data and drift is for being able to uh, identify a divergence in the data that you're seeing or the predictions. We, we are able to use another of our open source frameworks called Alibi Detect, which has a broad range of different uh, techniques that you can actually try out yourself and more importantly, deploy yourself. And in this case, we are able to actually show how we're able to leverage uh, an outlier detector that we train locally following the same pattern as we did with the model. You train your model locally or your outlier detector, you export it, you deploy it, right? From this perspective, now we can see that the, every single request that it sends to your model, it's forwarded and it can be captured by any um, advanced monitoring component. In this case, it's an outlier detector, which is able to flag whether there's an outlier or not. And similarly for the drip detection, we follow the same pattern. In this case, a KS drip detector, we're able to train it locally and then deploy it in the same manner such that it performs the same pattern as the outlier detector, but instead of acting on a single data point, it acts on a window of data. So every, let's say, 100 or 1,000 of requests, it would calculate that data drift, right? So that's basically uh, some of the core des design patterns of the drift detection. Um, and, you know, you have to take into consideration things like scope, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, whether it is a classification or regression task, as well as other things. But you can try all of this in the hands-on code that we provide uh, as part of that blog post. Now, the last component is the explainability piece. And you may have heard about explainability in the context of you know, Jupyter Notebooks, where you perform an explanation. But now remember that what we're seeing here is how do we achieve this at scale? How do we enable these human interpretable insights in a production environment? And 
we are able to still leverage the same component. Uh, in this case, it's our Alibi that explain library, which has a broad range of different techniques like kernel shap, counterfactuals, anchors, etc., all which can be deployed. The only difference is that similar to how the model receives a request and returns an inference response, the explainer receives a request, uh, reverse engineers the model for an intuition, and then returns the actual explanation, right? And there are some nuances to take into consideration how to choose your expl explainer, but again, you know, you're able to delve into more details uh, in the repo as well as in the example. This is, you know, whether your explanation is local versus global, where it's a white box versus black box. This means whether you actually will need the artifact of the model as part of the explainer, or whether you can interact with, with the separate services, as well as the data type, whether it's tabular, image, text, etc. Now, from an intuition, you know, this is what it would look like from a microservice perspective. You would be able to actually say, well, for my model that predicted that this is a truck, what are the specific reasons why it predicted that it was a truck? In this case, using the anchors explainer, it basically tells you all of the anchors that made uh, this image at least uh, 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 the most sort of like importance to be predicted, predicted as a truck. Now, there is a side note uh, about things that we're not going to cover in this talk, things like adversarial detectors that are another important thing and are also covered in the Alibi Detect library. Um, the actual uh, ensemble patterns that you can also leverage is something that we're not going to cover, but you can go into too much into more detail. This is basically the ability to have these architectural patterns building upon each other, right? So a model that has a metric server and a drift detector that actually acts on top of the metric server instead of just the model. But, you know, this is basically just emphasizing the power that these architectural patterns provide, not just the abstraction, but also the flexibility that, that they introduce. So, you need to take into consideration all the things, things like alerting, you know, what do you want to do when drift is detected, defining the service level objectives or server level indicators, as well as how you feed that into your promotion strategy and being able to drill down into any of the results that you provide. But again, this would go well beyond uh, the scope of this talk. Uh, and the, sco the scope of this talk is already very, very large. So I think that is a good point to uh, stop on. Uh, today, we covered the motivations for machine learning monitoring. We covered some principles for some efficient approaches, as well as some scalable patterns that you can adopt that actually work at massive scale, um, as well as the hands-on example, which you can find in uh, the code provided. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, if there's time uh, for questions, I'll be able to answer. If not, then we'll be able to cover them offline. So thank you, everybody, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the conference. All right, what a lovely talk. I, I, I think you, um, you were able to simplify a lot of concepts, and uh, if someone like me could understand it, then, then I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of participants would have, would have been able to understand it. So uh, again, thank you so much for the, uh, for the lovely talk. Um, I Thank am you. right now looking to see uh, if there are any questions. Someone's typing something, so maybe we give it a second. All right, there's one question. I'm just going to copy it and put oh, it Oh, I up. can see it. I can see it. Yeah, I'm just going to put, put it up on the big screen. If, if should, I, should I read it out loud? Yeah, so it is, what would you do if a model starts to drift, but the model takes days to retrain? Uh, would you keep the existing one in production until the new one is retrained? Oh, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And that's that's very much a, a corner. Well, not I wouldn't say a corner case. Probably, I mean, something super common as well. Um, I mean, unfortunately, when there's a time constraint, there's a time constraint, right? Like if, if it takes days to retrain and you found out that there's drift, then there would be kind of like an assessment of what that drift really means. And that's actually something that uh, our data science team is, is working on is around the question of perhaps not all drift is um, um, uh, you know bad. It is the question of like which drift um, is the one that would perhaps have certain implications and the ex interpretability of drift that is flagged. But in in your context, I mean, there's a lot to consider. Is basically what is the risk of keeping the model running based on what that drift uh, 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 means in particular? So yeah, I mean, not a very sort of like, you know, black and white answer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, fortunately, 
some of these libraries and some of these patterns should at least provide you with a core foundation to tackle those challenges. Mm -hmm. All right. I I I hope uh, that, that that answers the question of the um, person who asked it. And um, um, someone said that this this is the best talk of the conference. So congratulations on that. <laughs> well, I I really appreciate it. These are the best attendees of the conference. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So um, in that case, if anyone has any questions, then they can probably find you in the breakout room of uh, Parrot. And uh, thanks again for your talk. Thank you very much. All right.